Hi, everyone. Future Hindsight has grown beyond my wildest dreams, and I'm so pleased to announce that because of that, we're starting a membership service on Patreon called The Civics Club. With your support, you'll get transcripts, extended ad-free episodes, bonus interview content, and more. Civics Club starts with our new season on August 14th, and I hope you'll become an early supporter at our special introductory rate. Thank you. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guests today are Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan. Jennifer is professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, and Seamus is professor and chair of sociology at Columbia. They co-authored Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus, which emerged out of a much larger project called the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, or SHIFT. This study consisted of ethnographic research, a large survey of over 1,600 graduates about their histories, relationships and experiences with sex and assault, and another survey of nearly 500 students about their daily lives over 60 days. This deep ethnographic engagement within the work of a large research team has allowed them to contextualize and enrich their findings, yielding fresh insights. This is a bonus episode outside of our usual themed seasons and presents a different way of thinking about the roots of sexual assault on campus and the kinds of solutions that are thus possible. We talk frankly about sex and sexuality, so if you are with young children, this is not an appropriate episode to share with them. And the real question we ask is, why have we failed? How is it possible that these young people who are so accomplished in so many ways and have learned so much and mastered so many other vitally important lessons have not been taught to recognize their own sexual autonomy or respect other people's. We discuss sexual assault prevention on campus, structural power imbalance, comprehensive sexuality education, and what we owe each other as citizens. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for joining us as well, Seamus. It's a pleasure to be on. So let's start with the basics. How do you define assault? Assault is unwanted, non-consensual sexual contact. In Sexual Citizens, we lay out the diversity of experiences that encompass campus sexual assault and the ways in which people who are not bad people end up doing things that are harmful to their peers. I think one of the things that struck me about your study is that the people who assault others are everyday people, and often they are in our group of friends. And I think this also makes it so hard to report it afterwards or to make sense of it and say, yes, this definitely happened to me. Why do people not report their assault? We find that only about 3% of the experiences of sexual assault were reported to the institution. And a big point of our book is that we spend way too much time thinking about what to do after assaults occur, and not enough time thinking about what should we be doing to make them less likely in the first place. We also want to change the perspective of people from thinking about how do we adjudicate those he said, she said moments, and instead, what are the sets of things that we can do to make assault less likely to happen in the first place? It may seem like we should just get everybody to report, but people have lots of good reasons for not wanting to report what happened to them. One young man told us a story about how he'd grown up in a fairly conservative family in the Midwest, and they weren't supportive of his sexuality. And when he got to New York City, he really wanted a relationship. And eventually he found it, and he was really happy to have found that relationship. But he also told us this story about how his boyfriend was really forceful about sex. And there were nights where his boyfriend would come home kind of drunk and, in his own words, basically raped me. 
this young man, we call him in the book, Adam, didn't want to report what happened. And he didn't want to report what happened because his relationship was really valuable to him. And Adam wasn't that unique. There are a lot of people in the book who have deep relationships with the people who assault them. The vast majority of people are assaulted by somebody they know, often by somebody they've had some previous sexual contact with, and frequently somebody who's embedded within their friend group. And so rather than focusing on like, how do we punish people after this happens and get everyone to report, we want to think like, how do we just make the experience less likely? How do we transform Adam's boyfriends in ways that he sees that what he's doing is assault, that it's inappropriate, and that he needs to respect, in our terms, his boyfriend's sexual citizenship, that is his boyfriend's right to say yes and his right to say no to sex. And so, so much of what we lay out is trying to figure out ways in which to promote that kind of prevention effort. So you mentioned sexual citizenship now, both of you. How did you come to define what a sexual citizen is? We didn't invent the term. There's been other work in social scientific research on sexuality that has used the idea of sexual citizenship. But at its heart, I think the title is a little bit of a provocation because there's so much discomfort in America around young people's sexuality. We think we can't prevent sexual assault without acknowledging that as part of their journey to adulthood, young people have a right to sexual self-determination, to choose sexual experiences, that we can't say to them, say no to sex or listen to other people when they say no, if we don't also open up the possibility that they can say yes to sex. And so it's about needling a little bit at the discomfort that adults have with young people's sexuality by asserting that young people do have the right to sexual self-determination. A young woman, Gwen, we call her in the book, she was a tall, blonde, beautiful young woman who sort of fell right into the New York City club scene. And she would go out and, you know, end up at the end of the evening with some not very famous actor or sort of a B-list athlete. And they would invite her back to their hotel rooms and she would go, but she was clear she didn't want to have sex. And so she described to us how her strategy was to give them a blowjob just to get out of there. And those aren't assaults, but she wasn't the only woman who described to us an experience where she felt like she had to do something she didn't want to do rather than be in an awkward social situation. And we're not blaming Gwen for not feeling like she was a sexual citizen. And so sexual citizenship raises the question of why do people think that other people owe them sexual pleasure? And the real question we ask is, why have we failed? How is it possible that these young people who are so accomplished in so many ways and have learned so much and mastered so many other vitally important lessons have not been taught to recognize their own sexual autonomy or respect other people's. So what's the answer? Why has our society failed these young people in teaching them sexual literacy and the idea even that we are each sexual citizens who are not owed sexual favors from other people, nor do we owe that to others? There are things that I think we can really concretely point to. The first one is sex ed. Almost all of the young people we spoke to talked about the sex ed that they got as, you know, just woefully inadequate. The joke was basically that it wasn't sexual education. It was actually the sexual diseases course. They described being shown pictures of different STDs or having fear put into them about all the terrible consequences of sex. And, you know, no one really sat down with really any of the young people that we spoke to and said to them, you know, sex is going to be a really important part of your life. It's going to be one of the ways in which you connect with the people around you. And you need to be clear about what you want out of your sexual life. And you need to find ways to have that life with others that are respectful of their wants and desires. And so one of the first things we would point to is the sort of impoverished sexual education that people get. One of the main findings was that for women who had experienced comprehensive sexuality education, which included practicing refusal skills, they were half as likely to be raped as women who didn't. 
And this shows the real profound impact that sexuality education can have. And we need to think much more about providing that education to young people. And we need to start much younger in providing that education to young people. Right now, even the best sexuality education is often very biologized. It's not that biology is unimportant, but it's kind of like teaching young people to drive by explaining to them the role of spark plugs in the internal combustion engine. Instead, we need to sort of start really young, educating young people about sex and sexuality. We say to young kids, like, use your words, don't grab. That is fundamentally a sexual assault prevention strategy. And if we can start to sort of have these conversations at younger ages, to institute them more fully across all kinds of schools and other places, I think we'll be far more successful in helping prevent sexual assaults. In fact, this is one of the reasons young people embark on what you call a sexual project, because they really don't know and they have to find out by themselves and they do this by trial and error. So what is, is a sexual project and in what way is it more likely that somebody will either commit an assault or be assaulted? So sexual project asks and answers the question of what sex is for, which you might think, only a college professor would even ask that question because we know what sex is for. Sex is for pleasure or for having babies. But I mean, none of the students we spoke with were having babies at that moment. And a lot of college sex is not that pleasurable. And so if you listen to their stories, you see that students use sex to figure out who they are, to accrue experience, to deal with their own anxieties about not having a lot of sexual experience, sometimes to impress their friends. And that can put them in situations where they hurt other people because they don't see sex as something to share, but rather something to have, which potentially regards the other person as an object. So sexual projects is a way of stepping back and seeing what young people are trying to achieve through sex, because so many interactions that lead to assault begin as sexual interactions. And that's really one of the things that's so distinctive about sexual citizens is that we see sex as different than assault, but you can't understand sexual assault without also looking at sex. If you've listened to the last couple of weeks, you know that The Jordan Harbinger Show gives listeners a look inside the minds of some of the most interesting people in the world. You might also know that Jordan's mission is to give listeners deep, meaningful insights to make their lives better. Did you know that Apple named his podcast one of the best of 2018? Or that Jordan has hosted an iTunes Top 50 podcast for 12 years? Whatever your interests are, Jordan's show will surely pique them. Find out what it's like to lose the Nobel Prize, how to overcome imposter syndrome, or how to become a great mentor to someone. Either way, Jordan has you covered. If listening to Future Hindsight makes you more civically engaged, listening to The Jordan Harbinger Show will make you more engaged in the world around you, even if you shouldn't go outside right now. I really enjoy his show, and I think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find the show at jordanharbinger.com. In many ways, I feel like when I read the book that a lot of the people who were assaulting others did it almost by accident. They didn't mean to. They kind of fell into it because of the circumstances in which they found themselves. And this is definitely true when you have a power imbalance. How does a power disparity exacerbate the conditions in which assault can occur? One of the stories that really struck me was the story of Lucy and Scott. And she said no. And he said, it's OK. When I read it, I thought, oh, I totally can see this guy. And he just didn't even hear her. He had no idea what she was saying. What do you say about power disparities and sexual assault on campus? When we say that assaults are many different kinds of things, part of what we're suggesting is that there may be some assaults that are committed by people who really do want to harm others. But we suspect that the vast majority of assaults are actually things where people think that they're having sex. And the story of Scott and Lucy is a story where, you know, Lucy's lived a pretty 
isolated life until she gets to college. And she's got this plan of what she wants out of her early college days. And, you know, she wants to go out drinking. She wants to meet some boys and make out with them. She wants to have sex for the first time. The kind of second weekend she's there, she and a good friend of hers go to this bar where they meet Scott. Lucy ends up making out with Scott. They head back to his fraternity house. Lucy's friend actually is concerned and calls her. She's gotten a bystander intervention training and catches up with them. And Lucy actually is pretty excited about what's happening. Her college plan is coming into view. She's making out with a boy that she thinks is kind of cute. He's a senior. And Scott asks Lucy if she wants to go up to his room. And she does. For her, what that meant was hanging out with him, making out, maybe doing something. But as you recounted, Scott starts to unbutton her pants and she says, no. And he says, it's okay. And from our framework, you know, what Scott is doing is invalidating Lucy's sexual citizenship, invalidating her right to say no to that sex. And it's the moment where their sexual encounter becomes a sexual assault. And there are many ways to read what Scott is doing. And it's important to keep in mind, we never spoke to Scott about this encounter. We have Lucy's account of what happened. And I think the most charitable view of Scott is that he simply didn't understand the various modes of power that he had in that moment. You know, Scott's probably got at least 30 or 40 pounds on Lucy. That certainly matters. Lucy didn't have a lot of experience with drinking and Scott had much more. He was a senior living in a fraternity house. And so there was the imbalance of their drinking. One of the modes of analysis that we use is a spatial analysis or thinking about the ways in which sexual geographies are really important. So Scott was in his own room, surrounded by brothers from his fraternity who were outside of that door. And that gave Scott a huge amount of power and control. And he may not have recognized the way in which that weighed upon Lucy But it certainly mattered. So he had the power of his friendship group that surrounded him. He had the power of being a senior where she was a freshman. He had the power of his size and his gender. And all of these things layered on didn't make the assault inevitable, but it made it much more difficult for Lucy to sort of enact what it is she wanted beyond that initial no. So there are two things here that you just said. One is the sexual geography, that she was in his room, in his fraternity house, but also that he was surrounded by his friends. So not only did he have the advantage of the geography, but also of his group. And one of the things that you point out in the book is that groups have a large amount of influence in how these interactions end up. And repeatedly you say, oh, they thought he was just getting lucky or it looked like she was having a good time and then they left them. But essentially, you know, they left her or him in a lurch without understanding that. Yeah, I think that the sort of typical way that people think about groups in relation to campus sexual assault is to imagine a fraternity that explicitly works together to either produce an assault or to cover one up. But the power that we surface is much more subtle. At no point in the evening of that story of Lucy and Scott did the fraternity brothers get together and plan for an assault to happen. But the point that we make is that they don't have to because the power works silently through actually the physical building of the fraternity. Both the social institution of Scott's fraternity brothers and the physical setting are part of the power of the group. For a book about sexual assault, it's actually pretty hopeful and optimistic because we really do think that our analysis opens the door to new strategies to prevention. For example, if you understand how geographies produce vulnerability to assault, you can also start to think about transforming those geographies through relatively simple changes like Columbia has started keeping one of the cafeterias open all night so that students who want to be alone together, maybe have been drinking or at a party, have some place to go other than a bedroom where the only place that they could sit together is a bed. So sexual geographies shows you the power of social organizations on campus, but it also points to a whole new set of interventions for prevention. 
Oh, well, that's great to hear that they did that. You say towards the end of the book that uncovering sexual assault's deep social roots suggests that sexual assault prevention is inextricable from broader projects of social justice. So aside from like keeping a cafe open all night long, how do you envision a social justice movement or a social justice solution to address sexual assault on campus? Every single black woman that we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Every single one. And as much as that is part of a gendered dynamic of people feeling comfortable touching women's bodies, it's also a racial dynamic of the fundamental disrespect of Black women's bodies by their peers at Columbia and Barnard. Part of the point there is that in order to address sexual assault, Part of what we have to do is address racial inequalities and think about how it is that we can address that fundamental disrespect for black women's and black men's bodies. It's also important to note that some of the highest rates of assault are experienced within the LGBTQ community. And so for us, it's why is that happening and how do we address it? Well, part of the explanation that we offer up is the ways in which queer identities are often invalidated within families, within high schools, and that this really puts young queer people in particular at risk for experiencing assault in part because of the shame and denial that is so much a part of many of their high school experiences. Students who have difficulty paying for basic needs are more likely to experience assault. And so all of these things point to the fact that, of course, gender is a really important factor for understanding assault. But if we stop our analysis there, we're not going to really get at the multiple reasons and the multiple ways that people experience assault. And those experiences of assault are fundamentally grounded in power and precarity. And so that in order to do effective assault prevention, one of the things that we need to commit ourselves to is a general project of equality. And we very much believe that racial justice work, as well as work that supports, lifts up the experiences of LGBTQ students, is going to be work that has multiple benefits, one of which is a benefit of moving us towards sexual assault prevention. Yeah, well, there are so many questions I have right now. But one is about the story about Carl in the book, because he is someone who actually goes so far as tapes the consent of any woman that he ends up making out with or more. And he really does it as a matter of self-defense. And I thought that was such a powerful story because he understands so deeply What's at stake for someone like him if something goes wrong? What did you think when you first heard his story? A lot of the young men we interviewed expressed a fear of false accusation, which, by the way, is a very rare thing to actually happen. But they have all sat through those consent education sessions. What they absorb is that men are responsible for getting consent, that it's their job as men to sort of manage the consent process. There is that widespread anxiety about doing consent wrong. But in reading the transcripts, we were bowled over by how different Black men's recounting of consent was, because there was a sense of precarity. And Carl's story of taping the women that he had sex with, saying that they'd had a good time because he had done his homework and he knew that a tape recording would be admissible in court as evidence, even if he hadn't asked the person's consent to record them. That reveals a level of precarity, which is inseparable from his experience of precarity, both as a student on campus, but also as a Black man in America. So you can't separate the ways that people do sex and consent out from their broader social experiences. I mean, if you look from the beginning of American history, sexual assault has been about race. Slavery, To Kill a Mockingbird, the history of lynching, so many examples. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Black men's experiences of consent are different. Instead, we should be surprised that we're surprised. 
Yes, indeed. We should be surprised that we're surprised. You said earlier that every single black woman on campus has been taught in a sexual manner that they did not want. Actually, I was surprised that that's not happening to white women because I bet it happens to everybody. I don't know anybody personally, a woman to whom this has not happened, including to myself, you know, and I just thought, I think maybe you're underestimating (laughs) the occurrence among all women. So much of the debate on sexual assault has been about the numbers. So there's the one in four statistic. Is it true that one in four women in college have experienced some kind of unwanted sexual touching or experience? As much as people think like that number is way too high, we sort of think of it as it's probably way too low that the number of people who just experience unwanted touching is and don't even categorize it or think about it as an unwanted experience, but just part and parcel of, you know, being a woman in New York City, of being a person in the world. In the stories that people told us, the sexual assaults that they experienced and the ones that they experienced as particularly harmful, they weren't just about the assault. It was about the ways in which they had been violated by friends or that spaces that they thought were safe for them or places that were kind of home for them on campus suddenly no longer were. And the ways in which we look at the social roots of sexual assault thinks about it not as an isolated experience, but something that's deeply embedded within their social experiences. And because of that, have big impacts that go beyond just that experience of sexualized touching. So what is the moral framework that we should be using when we think about sexual citizenship and let's say sex education, especially since we're talking about young people? Our focus is on the extent to which people recognize the fundamental humanity of the people that they're having sex with. So do they recognize that the person that they're having sex with is not a sort of human scratching post, but actually a person with the right to sexual self-determination? That requires less fear of young people and more compassion. There's a big role that parents can play in this in recognizing young people's sexual citizenship. We prepare them both to say yes and no, and to be able to hear other people around them when they want to have sex or don't want to have sex. Parents really are the most important deliverers of values around sexuality. So if the only message that parents ever give their children is not under my roof, what they're saying is, I refuse to recognize you as a sexual citizen. That doesn't set people up very well for figuring out the values that they want to bring to a sexual interaction. I think that there is really no more important opportunity that parents have to provide a values message around sexuality when they have children who are in a relationship than to say, yeah, you know, under my roof, that's okay. If you're in a relationship with someone you care about each other, you're kind to each other, that shows young people, I see you emerging into adulthood We want you to find love and intimacy and pleasure, hopefully maybe all those three things at the same time with the same person. This is part of of launching into adulthood. This is what I aspire to for you. Yeah, well put. I'm going to have to keep that in mind. What are two things I could be doing as an everyday citizen, a parent, or maybe even somebody who doesn't have children to advance this notion that we're all sexual citizens and that we have a right to our bodily integrity and we can make our own decisions. So one of the first things that we can do is start having conversations about sex that are filled with a sense of empathy and hope rather than a sense of shame and a sense of fear. If people listening along right now are thinking like, what can I do? Comprehensive sexuality education is something that, contrary to what you might think, it actually has broad-based support across the political spectrum. It's something that parents really want provided for their kids. And I think calling state legislatures and saying, this is something you need to pass. It's absolutely essential for our young people that they're provided with this education because there are all kinds of things that we teach people in school. But one of the fundamental lessons needs to be 
how sex is going to be an important part of their life and they need to do sex in ways that are respectful of others. That truly will be protective for them. All right. Last question. This is one that I would like to ask both of you each. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? What makes me hopeful is that I see young people across the country demanding comprehensive sexuality education, making the connection between sexual assault prevention and comprehensive sex ed. And, you know, in the same way that they're taking to the streets for gun control and to stop climate change and to advance racial justice, I think that this generation that sees the power of collective politics, the tide is turning for comprehensive sex ed. And what's driving that change is young people. I have to say that doing this research project made me really deeply respect the young people who are in college right now. I think that they're deeply committed to imagining a different kind of world and trying to bring it into being. And I think one of the things that made me hopeful is that even though we had kind of fallen down on some of our own jobs of raising this next generation, there were so many times where I was just like touched and inspired by them. And it's one of the things I think I'm most appreciative for in doing this research project is in getting close to their lives and kind of pulling back the curtain on the experience of college, just having a newfound respect for these young people who aren't snowflakes, but instead enduring a lot and doing so with grace and fundamental respect for the world around them. And it it makes me hopeful. Oh, that's beautiful, both of you. Thank you so much for being on Future Hindsight and thank you for your scholarship. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you for raising up this conversation. I've never really thought about how our values are reflected in our sex lives. In a society that rarely speaks about sex and sexuality within our actual lived experience, I also never considered that young people do need to learn how sex will be a big part of their adult lives. Seamus really made me laugh when he said that sex education today is like teaching someone how to drive by explaining the role of the combustion engine. Instead, we must teach what it means to show up as humans for each other with respect and compassion especially in our most intimate moments. It's no surprise that in this context, a right to sexual self-determination is directly relevant to the protests around the country demanding social justice. Effective sexual assault prevention is only possible when we also tackle the issues of race, gender, structural bias, and imbalance of power. Our next guest is Eitan Hirsch, He's associate professor at Tufts University, who researches and teaches about civic participation, U.S. elections, and voting rights. He's the author of Politics is for Power, How to Move Beyond Political Hobbyism, Take Action, and Make Real Change. Politics is about working with other people with some goals and strategies to influence the government. I think a lot of people might not like the direction the country is taking on specific issues or in general. They might want something different. They might want to address an environmental problem, an immigration problem, an economic problem. And politics is the way we solve problems. The problem is that most people who kind of say they care about that and most people who are spending a ton of time thinking about that are just not doing anything. We discuss how we can move from political hobbyism to actually building real political power and how we can wield it effectively. Our conversation will kick off a new season for Future Hindsight, where we'll be focusing on political power building and cover everything from the Tea Party to building a Democratic Party precinct on campus, the role of the Supreme Court in exacerbating power inequality, and even modern dictatorships. We're taking a short summer break, and we'll be back on August 14th. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumpu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at 
futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.